Well, welcome, friends. Father Frank here. I'm behind the controls at the moment. I'll be coming uh, into the camera shot in just a second, and we're happy to be streaming live tonight on this Pro-Life Prime Time and uh, giving a chance here for all the different channels that we're on to connect. We're so glad uh, to be with all of you on Getter. Uh, we have the stream going there and, of course, on all the different other platforms, Facebook and YouTube and Twitter and in uh, uh, all our various accounts. So thank you, friends, for joining me. Let me go around from the control booth over to the, to the chair. And uh, we're going to talk pro-life tonight. And that's our, uh, that's our passion. That's our priority. That's our world. That's our vocation. And uh, it is great to have you with us in the battle. I can see your comments. So please um, uh, let me know what, what's on your mind. Let me know your questions. I mean, I have thoughts to share with you, but I always want to make sure that we're addressing the concerns or questions of the people who are watching us. So I see some of our faithful regular viewers here and uh, Linda and Michael and uh, uh, so many others that will be joining us, Colin and... Uh, uh, we're just great to be with you all. Uh, you know, we usually start with this book, Pro-Life Reflections for Every Day. Then I want to reflect with you about, about a funeral of a pro-life leader that I helped to uh, officiate at yesterday, uh, of course, as a, in, in a lay capacity, but uh, was an interdenominational service in a funeral home, and, and we had um, just an inspiring time at the uh, Celebration of life of our good friend Mark Crutcher. Well, I want to talk a little bit about that, some of the lessons uh, from that. By the way, tomorrow night at this time, I'm going to come on live again, but it's not going to be this kind of, uh, of, a, of a broadcast. It's going to be, I'm going to have the whiteboard with, with me. I'm going to stand at the podium. And it's going to be a special session about and for clergy, not just for them exclusively, but for you also that are not clergy, but we're going to talk about encouraging and equipping the clergy for the pro-life cause. That, of course, has always been, from the beginning, the core of our work here at Priests for Life. And, um, you know, what we've been doing here for a while is having these monthly seminars on Zoom for priests and deacons, and we've had them join us from around the country. Uh, and it's part of what we call the Good Shepherd Project. You can see the goodshepherdproject.com uh, for more details. Uh, but, I, but we decided now going forward in this uh, early part of 2023 at least to try the method of a live broadcast like we're having now. It enables some uh, clergy to join who might want to join anonymously you know, they could watch it, they could even submit questions, but it, it, it would be a little easier for some of them than if you're on a Zoom call, I mean, then, you know, we know who you are, and, and uh, of course, uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but the point is some are, are more comfortable doing it with a little bit more arm's distance, and also, so many of you who are not priests or deacons but want to know how to encourage the clergy uh, deserve to hear uh, the ideas and the resources that we present to them uh, in order to, to be more effective in dealing with the issue of abortion. We know uh, how much people thirst for this kind of leadership from the clergy. It's how Priests for Life began. It's how we got our strength uh, at the beginning and mean we maintain our strength because people want to see this kind of leadership. So let's pray using my book, Pro-Life Reflections for Every Day. And uh, let's uh, go to the entry for today, March 15th. The passage from 2 Timothy 2.12, If we endure, we shall also reign with him. Reflection. In Lent, the church enters more deeply into meditation on the suffering death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Life was sacred because he made it. And by his passion and resurrection, it is even more sacred because now it is raised to the heights of heaven to reign with him. Let us pray. Lord, I am filled with wonder at your love for human life, everyone, born and unborn. May our laws and practices treat human beings with the highest respect due to them. Amen. So many of you see my spots. I hope you notice my spots on the various social media accounts where I do one of these reflections from this book. 
And as I always say on those spots, you can obtain this book at ProLifeReflectionsForEveryday.com. Speaking of books, Janet's book, you know, uh, I hope you have a copy of this. I know many of you do. Everything You Need to Know About Abortion for Teens. Uh, equally good reading for adults. And uh, Janet recently presented at the Bringing America Back to Life conference in Ohio. Do any of you go to that conference or have you gone to that conference in the past? It has become a, quite a big pro-life conference. I'm very happy to see that. I know the, 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 the folks uh, who put that together. And uh, Janet presented on her book, had a nice workshop for youth and then also a workshop for the adult members of the, of the uh, conference. And um, Ohio, by the way, let me start out with, uh, with that. Olinda oh, has the book by Janet. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, Ohio is, is, a, is a key battleground. Uh, over the abortion issue right now in 2023 in the in the coming November elections. But before that, the pro-abortion side is trying to do in Ohio what they did in Michigan and in California, what they're going to try in numerous other states, to actually push through the Constitution abortion without limits. Now, first of all, abortion without limits is is is, a, is an extreme policy that the American people you know the American people have never agreed with that, and that's an important talking point to keep in mind. It is the policy of the Democrat Party, but it's a policy that has never been a policy of the American people. It was imposed by the Supreme Court in its fictitious right to abortion that it put in place 50 years ago in Roe v. Wade, but the court said, oops, sorry, we made a mistake. There is no such right in the Constitution. That, of course, was the Dobbs decision. You guys can work out the policy legislatively, is what the Dobbs decision said. Yeah, but you see, the other side is afraid of working it out legislatively because that means we can persuade people with the arguments that show the baby is a baby, that show abortion harms women, that show it, but it's not a good idea to kill people to solve our problems. And the other side knows that we are the ones that have the persuasive arguments. They don't have any arguments at all. Not only are they not persuasive, they're not existent. So they, want, they try to avoid the legislative process as much as possible. What do they try to do? Well, let's, let's impose or declare some kind of dogma from on high that there's a right to abortion. And if there's a constitutional right to abortion, well, now there sh that should shut down all argument. And that, in fact, is what happened for 50 years. A lot of people get uh, shut down because who wants to speak up against the constitutional right? Right? So you see what the other side tries to do. They always try to hide behind these fictitious rights, these imagined uh, fake uh, dogmas. Okay. So being they lost that on the federal level, no right to abortion in the U.S. Constitution, now they're trying to push this fake right into the state constitutions so that they can hide behind that. But here's the point, and here's the point we have to be better and better at making, all of us. The same arguments by which the Dobbs case came to the conclusion and showed very persuasively that never in American history was there a purported right to abortion in the Constitution. For that very same reason, there was never a purported re, uh, assertion uh, 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 of a right to abortion in the Ohio Constitution or for that matter in the Michigan Constitution, or in California. What applies, in other words, to the whole country in the arguments that Dobbs laid out applies to each of the states. Because remember, Dobbs points out there was never a single state that asserted a right to an abortion. Not a single state constitution. Not a single law. Not even a scholarly article in a law journal. No right to abortion until they invented it in 1973. So use the arguments in Dobbs. That's why we set up that special website, supremecourtvictory.com. Go there, use the arguments, read the decision, quote from the decision, watch the video, share the videos. And they are, uh, they are uh, uh, as Colin is saying, taking this battle to a new level 
They want to push, ram down the throats of the American people, bypassing the legislative process. Why? Oh, because that's the process where citizens can persuade their legislators. You can sit down, you can reason, you can give information, you can have uh, hearings. You have to have hearings. Uh, there could be amendments. There are expert witnesses. Uh, uh, this process is, is, is it, it, it favors us too much for the other side to, 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 to be able to tolerate it. So be aware, friends in Ohio. And, and you know, we usually, uh, we uh, recently had uh, here our meeting of pro-life leaders. I told you about it as it was approaching and as it was happening. Very proud to have had that meeting. And uh, the 40 or 43 or so leaders that were here all agreed that every one of these state battles needs to be a national battle. In other words, that all of us who are running national groups and all the pro-life people in all the other places of the country, when there's like a battle in Ohio like there is now, we've all got to come together and back up the pro-life efforts in that state. We can't leave the states to try to win these battles themselves. Because the other side makes it a national battle in their circles. They make it a battle where really you look at how these these pro-abortion amendments that all passed in the midterms the money was pouring in from other places not from that state money was pouring in from other places and this is how it's going to be especially when the state is 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 a red state like ohio when the state is essentially a pro-life state like ohio is You're going to have the other side pumping in money and resources and speakers and volunteers and all kinds of, of efforts from coast to coast. So we need to do the same for our pro-life friends now in Ohio. In South Dakota, there's an effort going on there. Uh, and we'll keep you informed about each and every state, each and every effort that there's going to be. Make sure you're signed up for our action alerts at StopAbortionNow.org. And uh, we... Um, I know that we'll, our website team will be posting more information about the Ohio situation in the morning at our um, endabortion.us uh, website. So check that out. Uh, Gene is uh, writing in from, uh, let me see your comments here, from Indiana. Oh, my goodness. I've had so many great trips to Indiana and uh, so grateful for the different, a couple of different uh, Right to Life groups throughout the state gave me uh, pro-life awards not too long ago. And, uh, of course, you have the... Uh, the largest pro-life banquet in the nation there every year. I uh, was privileged to speak at that uh, last uh, year. Uh, so keep up the good work there in, uh, in uh, Indiana. And uh, let's see who else is, uh, has something to say here tonight. If you have any uh, particular questions or comments, let me know. Meanwhile, let me tell you about yesterday. We had the funeral of... Uh, Really a good friend um, and great ally in this pro-life cause, Mark Crutcher. You know, aside from all the pro-life work he did, which I want to comment on a little bit because all the leaders at the funeral were commenting on it and thanking him for it. Uh, he was also a close personal ally of mine in the battles that I've been having against uh, certain misguided uh, bishops. And Mark was just in there, right in there with me. He was not Catholic himself, but he fought for us as hard as any Catholic did, as hard as we ourselves were, have been fighting and continue to fight uh, against this misguided, um, really demonic cancel culture that has taken hold even within the church, that they would actually punish pro-life work and try to restrict it and cancel it. It's exactly what they do. They make up all kinds of excuses as to why they're doing it, uh, but not a, not a smidgen of it is true. And Mark was there seeing everything firsthand. He was a member of our board of directors uh, at Priests for Life uh, as well, and a great, great friend. Spent a lot of personal time with him and his family and his staff, and uh, he did with us. And it was just a, a, you know, a, one of the closest relationships that we have had over these 30 years of my um, full-time pro-life work. One of the closest relationships with any other group or any other leader in the movement. Uh, and he wasn't one, actually, you know, here's the interesting thing. You know, I talked to you about these pro-life leadership 
meetings that we have. We bring the leaders here. We bring the leaders together in Washington. We bring the leaders together on conference calls and Zoom meetings. But interestingly, Mark was never one to come in on these meetings. He, that, that wasn't his style. I mean, he appreciated what all the other leaders did. But he, and, he, and he spread, obviously he wanted to spread the word to them about the projects he was doing. But he was the kind of person who... He said, you know, I'm going to interact with those that I, that I know I, I, I know best, that I trust most, and that we actually have something, you know, going on with, in terms of collaboration. So any other groups, he was very generous with his time. He would go across, and, across the country and give seminars. He trained uh, over 100,000 pro-life activists and so on. But that he was never one for being, you know, part of these big group meetings. But nevertheless, the influence that he had surpassed that of most of the members uh, that are in these meetings. What did he do? First of all, you know, he was an innovative thinker. All the leaders that were there, many leaders were there from across the country yesterday for the funeral and the night before for the wake service, friends all that we have worked with uh, for many, for decades actually. And they all were of one mind, all agreed. He, he was one of the most innovative cutting-edge thinkers in the movement. You know, we have a lot of hard workers in the movement, but the, um, the ability to come up with new ideas for projects to do in the first place. I mean, we have a lot of hard workers, but um, the, to know what it is we should be working hard at is, is key. You know, you, uh, 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 you, you've heard the difference between being effective and being efficient. You know, being efficient means doing something in a way that best utilizes the time and the resources that you have, right? The shortest distance between two points is a straight line, and as close as you can get to a straight line, you know, get the job done, right? In an efficient way. Don't, don't do it in such a way that you're unnecessarily uh, expending, you know, time and, and energy that uh, you have little of. But being effective is something different. And, the, and people have explained the difference this way. Being efficient means doing the job right. Being effective means doing the right job. We have many groups and leaders who are very good at making sure pro-life work gets done efficiently. But we've got to be just as concerned, if not more, that we are doing our work effectively. Are we hitting the right target? Are we doing the thing that most needs to be done now? And one of the ways that Mark contributed to the movement is that he would come up with the most effective techniques, tactics, strategies. Some would call him more of a tactician than a strategist in the sense of you know, coming up with specific tools and specific projects. But he was also uh, someone who strategized in the big picture. But here was one of the key, the hallmarks of his thinking. Go after the weakness of the abortion industry. Attack at the weakest point. Now, Mark would often explain, for abortion to continue, you need supply, demand, and license. You need people requesting abortion. Uh, you need abortionists to do the procedure when it's requested. And then you need the legal permission for it to get done. And he said, you know, if we're going to be effective in the movement, you know, you've got a lot of people working to take away the license. So let's elect the right kind of lawmakers who are going to pass the right kind of laws to make abortion illegal and to restore protection to the unborn, get the right kind of court decision. I mean, these are mammoth tasks, and they take decades to accomplish. And you know what? We just accomplished a decades-long task of getting rid of Roe v. Wade. So it does work, and it does have to be done. But Mark said, you know, when it comes to the demand side, well, this is where the pregnancy center movement comes in. If we can provide people with alternatives to abortion, if we can help them know that they're not alone and that they, in fact, can have that baby, bring that baby to birth, and their life and their career and their education are not going to end, well, then we can decrease the uh, demand. 
But Mark always said the weakest link in the abortion industry is on the supply side. Look at the abortionists. The abortion industry, Mark always pointed out, has a big problem with turnover. You go into any abortion facility today, you go back three months from today, and <laughs> you're going to see a practically different staff. And it's easy to understand why it's so hard for an abortion clinic to hold on to personnel. Just think about it for a moment. It's so unnatural to kill babies. I mean, when you're doing that, you know, we work a lot with the people who used to be abortionists. By the way, welcome to those of you who are, who are tuning in. I see our numbers are going up. And friends, by the way, as we're talking, share this uh, broadcast. Try to invite more people to come on. But going, getting back to my point, we're talking about the passing of Mark Crutcher, president and founder of Life Dynamics based in Denton, Texas. Check out their website, lifedynamics.com. Their domain also that goes there is Pro-Life America, prolifeamerica.com. And Mark would say, look, the weak link in the abortion uh, movement are the abortionists themselves and the abortion clinics themselves. It's unnatural to kill babies, and therefore it's hard for people to persevere in doing that. You know, I always say, you know, you don't uh, uh, get tired of saving lives. You get tired of taking lives. And that scene and the work that we do with former abortionists or helping people get out of the abortion industry or helping people who have left the abortion industry to readjust to normal life. You know, you, you, you get tired of killing babies and that's why we have groups like the Society of Centurions and that was the, the dynamic in which I was trained by uh, Dr. Philip Ney, a psychiatrist who pioneered the model of helping uh, former abortionists uh, uh, you, 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 you get tired of killing because it's not natural. And so those who used to kill in abortion facilities have formed this society of centurions, society of those who, who, like the centurion at the cross of Jesus after he participated in his death, realized, oh, this was an innocent man, and he repented. But you don't have societies of former workers at pregnancy centers who have repented of saving babies do you? You don't get tired of saving lives. You get tired of taking them. So the weak link in the whole scenario of legal abortion are the clinics themselves and those who work in them. So Mark targeted that. He said, look, you're not going to take the stigma out of abortion. You can legalize it as much as you want. You can put as many, you know, uh, stamps of, of uh, the office of the governor and the you know, laws and, and even you know, executive orders from the President of the United States. Not that one, by the way, but the idiot we have in there now. And it still doesn't take the stigma out of abortion. You can dress it up in light, nice language. You can justify it all you want. You can write scholarly articles and books. You can make movies. Like Michael is saying, this is why Abby Johnson's work is important and, and you know Abby and I you know I helped her to launch that because it builds on this work that I'm talking about that Dr. Nay did and um, you know you don't you don't persevere in that it these people go through a living hell these abortionists they're conflicted about what they're doing and so Mark said what we've got to do is pour fuel on that fire. Increase the shame. Increase the stigma. Put a spotlight on the stigma because the stigma is not going to go away. They know that what they're doing is wrong. These abortionists, friends, they can't live with themselves. Don't let them ever fool you that, oh, yeah, oh, we're doing what's right. You know, we're helping women. We're, we're saving and serving. No, 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 no. They, 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 they resent what they do. And this goes into a whole, we don't have time, that would bring us in a different direction to talk about the whole psychology of that. But the fact that that's happening, Mark always says, well, you know, just to highlight the stigma of abortion, you know, make fun of 
these abortionists criticized them. You know, he called them the bottom feeders, and it's true. They're the lowest rung of the ladder of the medical profession. He would make cartoons about them, put out publications that would mock them. And this is not out of hatred. This is actually out of concern for these people and for the people that they're killing and the women that they're maiming. And highlight the stigma because you're not going to take... It's just like prostitution. You know, you could legalize it, but it's always going to have a stigma, isn't it? Nobody's proud to be known as an abortionist. I mean, there are some a handful that'll go around, you know, bragging about it. Oh, I do late-term abortions. Oh, I do it because of my faith, as abortionist Curtis Boyd says. But those are the exception, not the rule. Most of these men and women who are doing abortions, they try to hide it. They lurk in the shadows. That's why one of the great projects that Mark did, I mean, I literally I could go on all night about all the different projects that he did, most of which we were close collaborators in. And he would have a campaign to just announce to the uh, abortionists and to the local communities that they were going to advertise the fact that some of these doctors did abortions. Do you know that just the threat of a small local group in a town where a doctor was doing abortions, but most people didn't know it, and you can find out just by calling and asking, just the threat of publicizing that made a lot of these doctors stop doing abortions. Think about that for a minute. That just the threat of shining the spotlight on the fact that they were doing abortions. It's not even an argument that it's wrong, because remember, the genius of what Marx saw was that the stigma is there. The stigma is always going to be there. So attack the abortion industry at its weakest link, the abortionist, shine a light on the fact that they're doing abortions, and because it has such a stigma that they are ashamed of, even if they're not going to admit it, the fear of being brought out into the bright light of day will actually make a lot of them Quit doing it. Michael is right. He says, I don't know how abortionists can live with themselves. They, they can't. I bet they might be having nightmares of doing what they are doing. They do. They have nightmares. It leads to substance abuse. Um, if you read the book Lime 5, now this is, again, a Mark Crutcher book. But I helped them put it together, together with uh, a, a bunch of other pro-life leaders. This was all the way back in the 90s. So we're going back 30 years. Lime 5. Well, what does that mean? Lime 5, like the lime, like lemon lime, it's lime and then the number 5. Code word used by abortion facilities for, uh, uh, for the clients. Notice the depersonalization, right? Instead of using the name. It's part of the point of the book that this is a whole dehumanization. And if you can't respect the baby, you can't respect the mother either. And what Lime 5 does is it documents the hell that goes on inside abortion clinics. That's what it does. And you notice I'm using the word clinics. Now, I know a lot of us agree that these are not clinics. These, the clinic mean, you know, has a connotation and a meaning of health. There's nothing health-related going on there. It's a place of destruction and death. But you know, one of the approaches that Mark always took also was to say, well, look, when you're saying, um, when others are trying to say good things about these places, then resist using the word clinic. But when you're talking about the malpractice, when you're talking about the the raping of women inside of these abortionists, when you're talking about uh, what these abortionists do with with, um, uh, untrained staff and expired medications and equipment that doesn't work, people who don't know how to use it, falsifying medical records, insurance fraud, money laundering, when you're talking about all the evil things that go on inside of these places, then call them clinics. Because what we want to do is tar the reputation of these abortion places. Now, Mark did a very good job in doing that. And Lime 5 is a book 
that documents one after another after another case of malpractice. All documented cases from the news, from court records and official complaints with medical boards, etc., etc., all documented stuff. Unbelievable stories of the things that happen to the moms who go to these places. How abortionists, for example, there's a whole chapter about the sexual abuse that abortionists impose on their, uh, on their clients. Think about, Mark often pointed this out, think about the terrible position that that young lady having an abortion has put herself into. She's in the abortion facility. She's in the room with the abortionist. She may be under light or heavy sedation. <clears throat> and that abortionist right there in that situation, many of them, by the way, they hate women. They want to, they, you'll see in line five, some of them would, would do the procedure in such a way that increased the pain for that woman because they wanted to inflict pain on women. This is the sick mindset of these abortionists. And uh, we should ask our Democrat politicians what they think about this. So he's got her in a very vulnerable situation. If he abuses her sexually, notice the position of difficulty that she's in. If she brings up to someone else the abuse that she suffered, now she's got to reveal the fact she had an abortion. And that's the last thing so many of these women want to do. So there's a whole chapter in there about the sexual abuse. There's a whole chapter in there called Vacant Souls. And that's talking about the, 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 the soul of the abortionist and the fact that they hate themselves for what they're doing They'll wake up in their abortion facility on the floor amidst uh, vomit and smell of, of alcohol or, or drugs. I mean, these people are living in, in hell. And we've got to pray for them, and, and, and we will pray for them. Um, Mark did a whole lot of other things. He was ahead of his time. And you know, this, this exposing of the malpractice in the abortion facilities... Now, groups like Americans United for Life have also revealed the same kind of problems and abuses. Again, abortionists that are not qualified, staff that are not qualified, uh, 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 medications that are expired, equipment that doesn't work, emergency medical equipment that should be there but isn't even there, uh, all sorts of, of um, abuses. The more you dig, the more you find. That's always been true. It'll always be true. Uh, making it legal has not made it safe. And uh, Americans United for Life, in, in, in a uh, publication called Unsafe, reveal all this stuff, just like decades ago, Lime 5 revealed it as well. Bark also revealed, Mark Crutcher, those of you that are just joining us, we're talking about pro-life leader, founder of Life Dynamics, Mark Crutcher. His funeral was just yesterday. I helped uh, lead the service and speak at the service and lead some of the prayers. And we give our prayers and condolences to his wife, Tulane, and his uh, daughter, uh, Sheila. His brother, Wayne, uh, was there. Mark also exposed the, the sale of baby body parts in the abortion industry. Decades before our friend David Delighton did. Decades before, 20 years earlier. At the time, Congress was not as ready to do something about it as they eventually did after David uh, released those videos in 2015. Nor was it as easy in 2000 to get videos disseminated as it was for David 15 years later with YouTube and social media and all the rest. So dynamics had changed. But the reality of what was uncovered was just the same. Mark had undercover video 
of people who were buying and selling these baby parts, which is against the law and grossly immoral, he had them on camera. He had them on tape. And he released the footage. And people began to see that you can't practice vice virtuously. That's one of my sayings. You know, if your conscience is so broken, so darkened, so twisted, that you somehow see it as okay to kill babies, what do you care about insurance fraud? What do you care about breaking laws that say you can't sell the body parts? You just killed that body. You think you're going to care if you sell it? And so Mark had, and, and i got to bring on one of these programs. I don't have them right here. We have them actually on our website. we got a lot of stuff on that website, endabortion.us. I mean, it's a library. But you remember the order forms? I mean, we were distributing back 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, the order forms for brains, for eyes, for arms and legs, for livers, for hearts of aborted babies that the abortion facilities would sell to research laboratories. Interesting thing is how they would often specify no abnormalities because the testing they wanted to do on this tissue would have been tainted if the babies had some kind of genetic disease. And that's interesting because these are late-term babies. And the other side tries to argue, those lying pro-abortion Democrats try to argue all the time, whether on the floors of Congress or the halls of academia or talking one-on-one -on -one to their neighbors, that, oh, well, these late-term abortions are only done in the case of genetic abnormalities. Well, then how in the world can a research laboratory request the body of a late-term aborted baby with no abnormalities? No, no, no. Listen, don't buy for one minute the crap that the other side tries to, to push off on us about what is and isn't going on inside of these abortion facilities. One of the great legacies of Mark Crutcher is we know full well what's going on inside of those abortion facilities because we have shown a light on it, because we've gotten on the inside. I can't tell you how many hours I spent with Mark in his office looking at the surveillance equipment and talking about the the undercover agents that he had inside the abortion facilities, and he said, you know, it's not a matter of trusting them. I don't trust them. I don't have to trust them. I get what I get when they give it to me, and the evidence speaks for itself. Imagine you don't got to trust these people. They don't have to be your friends. They don't have to be pro-life. They've just got to be in there and willing to tell you and give you the information that they get. You know what Mark used to say? I repeat it all the time. Everything we need to know to end abortion is inside these abortion clinics. Think about that for a moment. Everything we need to know to end abortion is inside the abortion clinics. You just got to look in there and see what's going on. You know what one of the things we Mark did in the early years? Uh, he sent people to the NAF conferences. You know, NAF is National Abortion Federation, right? So there's Planned Parenthood, but there's also NAF. And these are, these are abortionists getting together and trade association for abortions. There's also NCAP, the National Coalition of Abortion Providers. So you've got these various entities, you know, professional uh, organization. So they have conferences. So Mark, this is, again, going back decades, would send people into these conferences and at that time, you know, you had the audio, audio cassettes. You'd go to a conference. At the end of the conference, they would say, okay, you want to order the full set of tapes of all the presentations that were made? And you would get these, you know, remember the plastic uh, 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 containers? It would be tw 10 or 12 or 20 or however many audio tapes in there, the old little cassettes. And Mark got them all and had them transcribed. I've got, all, I've got them all on my laptop all the transcriptions of all these conferences. You know the game of wishbone? You take the, you know, the, the, the V-shaped uh, chicken bones and you hold one end, I'll hold the other. We'll both pull it, see who gets the longer piece. The game of wishbone. 
Do you know that the abortionists play wishbone with the bodies of the babies that they kill? Can you imagine this? The two legs of the baby. Here, you take one, I'll take the other, let's pull it. This is the... Di well, of course they do. Because if you killed that baby, what difference does it make to you what you do with the body afterwards? You see, we get revolted by the idea of playing wishbone with a baby's body. We get revolted by that. Because we would never in a million years kill that baby. But you got to remember, these are vacant souls. These are people who have so dehumanized the baby that they've dehumanized themselves. They don't care. Once they've crossed that line of killing that baby, everything goes after that. Everything goes. And so it's amazing how people are, di are disturbed, you know, when the news comes out about the fact that they're selling these eyes and brains and livers. They go, oh, they get all disturbed by that. And they should. But how come they're not already disturbed even more by the fact that the babies were killed in the first place? They get so disturbed when someone like me shows an aborted baby on YouTube and Facebook. So much so that these fake, cowardly bishops, like the one I was under, coward that he is, hypocrite that he is, goes makes big public announcement, oh, we're going to do a big investigation into Father Frank because he showed people an aborted baby. Excuse me, but where's your outrage that the baby was aborted in the first place? You hypocrite. Where's your outrage that the baby was aborted? Maybe you're so sick and demented and your conscience is so twisted and malformed that the shame you have at not speaking up against the evil of abortion itself is prompting you to misdirect your anger at the people who are showing you and your Democrat friends what an abortion actually is. That's just a bit. Thank you, Angela, for affirming what you're saying. And Cheryl, that's right. Cheryl is saying the Vatican needs to reinstate you now. Father Frank Pavone. Well, <laughs> I mean, if, 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 if they can show me convincingly that I did something wrong at any point along the way, I'll joyfully repent. Repentance is our way of life. Ecclesia Semper Reformanda, the church, the people of God. Daily we have to be repenting. Daily we examine our conscience. Daily we say, Lord, have mercy. God, forgive us our sins. But they've got nothing. We're the ones showing the evil. Not doing the evil. We're showing the evil. And they get mad at us for doing that. But let me not get off on that tangent. What I'm saying is, as Mark Crutcher always points out, here's the weakness. The weakness is in the abortion clinics. And if we can shine the light in on what they're doing, we can shut them down. We got to get these. We gotta, and I'm going to be using, because uh, it's always, always valid and valuable information, using the very words of these abortionists to condemn them. By their words will, you will be uh, acquitted, Jesus said, and by your words you will be condemned. we got to condemn them with their own words. Playing wishbone with the baby. Can you imagine? You know what else they would do? They would play ball with the heads of the aborted babies in the hallway of the abortion clinics. This is what these people do. Oh, yeah, that's a meta, legal, legal medical procedure. Yeah, right, women's health. Yeah, right. Playing catch with the heads of babies. What kind of people are these? Playing catch with the heads of the babies. Friends, friends, let the people in your sphere of influence know what goes on in these abortion facilities. Let them know. 
like one of you was saying, it's demonic, it's sick, it's horrific. Those are the proper words for this. This is what we've got. See, what the other side always tries to do, right, is use the nice sounding rhetoric. You know, what a far cry this kind of language is that I'm using from, think about it, constitutional right, women's freedom of choice, women's health, reproductive rights. You know what? In and of itself, we're all in favor of those things. Constitutional rights, amen. We fight for them every day. Women's health, of course we want that. They hijack good things that we all want. They hijack what we all want. To hide, they use that language to hide a reality so horrific, as one of you is saying, horrible, gruesome. These are the words, truly horrible. There are no words, as Jacqueline is saying. And, and I like, Elizabeth, what you're saying. Sounds like a game in hell. Yes, it is. In fact, I, I, I gave a talk, Congressman Chris Smith was one of my, the first talks that he heard me give many, year, many years ago, and, and, and he, was, he quotes it to this day. I, it's a column that I wrote and a talk that I gave called Applause from Hell. You know what it was? It was uh, abortionist um, Martin Haskell. Back in the mid-90s, this was the partial birth abortion debate, right? In the early 90s, the paper came to light in which Haskell from Ohio was teaching other abortionists how to do a partial birth abortion. Now this a partial birth abortion, as you, as you will recall, is the procedure whereby the baby is partially delivered and then with scissors stuck in the back of the neck, the baby partially delivered already is killed and the delivery is completed. Well, and one of the reasons, by the way, that they do it that way is to be able to get intact body parts that later they can sell. And... Uh, um, so Haskell is, is doing these procedures and he uh, uh, is teaching others how to do it. So there was a talk. Remember I told you that Mark had the, the tapes from these conferences. So in one of these tapes, he's, uh, the abortionist is teaching these other abortionists to do the procedure, is showing a video of how the procedure works, describes it, and then gets to the end and says, and therefore, once you have done this, you have completed successfully the partial birth abortion. And they applaud. You hear this whole room full of physicians going like this when the brains have, have been successfully sucked out of the baby. Applause from hell. Applause from hell. I'm, I'm just in, in contact. I've been in contact for years. I've got to call him back tomorrow. Mr. Zachary King, you know Zachary King? Zachary and I have known each other for a long time. He's got a powerful, I endorsed his little book, his powerful testimony of being a Satanist, some kind of high priest in Satanism. And he testifies how abortions are done in these ritual sacrifices to Satan. You know, <laughs> and people wonder, and people wonder why people like us want to devote ourselves to ending this. It's because when you face it, when you look at it for what it is, if you're healthy, if you're alive, if you're awake, and if you have a conscience, you're going to be stirred up. And you're going to want to stop it. 
And that's why some people like me, some people like so many of you, have said, this is, this is it. This is my mission in life to stop abortion. It's the most reasonable thing in the world. And if you can't make it your full-time work, obviously, so many of you have the same passion. And uh, you say, okay, I'm going to do as much as I'm able to do. But I'm going to do it with passion. I'm going to do it with as much of my time and energy as my, own, my commitments allow. I'm going to do it. And I'm not going to stop doing it until the killing stops. And that's what <laughs> one, of, one of the favorite... Uh, quotes of Mark Crutcher has been over all these years. You know, he did a lot of broadcasting. We did a lot of broadcasting together. And if you uh, look at his broadcasts uh, at the end, he says, we're not here. We in the pro-life movement, we at Life Dynamics, we could say it of us at Priest for Life and all of you. We're not here simply to put up a good fight. We're here to win because winning is how the killing stops. Well, let's pause there. So much more we could say, but uh, we've been, uh, it's almost an hour. Let's, uh, let's, let's go into prayer. Uh, Father, we uh, are astonished once again, even though we have heard these things, many of these things, we are astonished once again at the level of corruption that the human heart and mind can reach at the level of rationalization that the human brain can come up with to justify these evils, we are horrified. And Lord, we thank you that we're able to feel horrified because if we weren't, then we would be dehumanized. We are horrified because we're healthy. We are disturbed because we're sane. We are deeply troubled because we see clearly. And so, Lord, we ask you to preserve in us that, that disturbance. Keep us always disturbed at what is going on in these abortion facilities. And keep us always alert as to how we can expose it, Lord. Expose and utilize and take advantage of the stigma that will always be in abortion. And that by revealing to our Friends and neighbors, we can rouse them to do something about it. Lord, we, we uh, pray for the family of Mark Crutcher. Give them your consolation. We pray for his wider family, the pro-life movement, the leaders, we who were closest to him. Lord, we are so sad that, that he is not with us in this life anymore. But we know that you are infinitely wise in your timing. And maybe, Lord, at this point in time, a crucial time for the pro-life movement, as we work to build on the victory of the Dobbs case, a time when more commitment is needed than ever and when more intelligent planning and innovative tactics are needed than ever, you have taken away from our midst one of the most innovative and creative leaders. Maybe, Lord God, it's because you're ready to inspire those same gifts and that same spirit in more of us. May we all rise to the occasion, work even harder and smarter, not only efficiently but effectively, to bring an end to this Holocaust. Lord, we hear the applause from hell. And we also hear the applause from heaven for every life saved, for every lie refuted, for every evil exposed, for every abortion prevented by the very people watching this broadcast right now. We thank you, Lord. We praise you because we are saving lives and we are refuting lies and we are stopping abortion each and every day. So let us experience, let us always hear within our hearts the applause from heaven. The applause, Lord God, from you yourself. When we take the steps we take and the efforts we make 
in this great pro-life cause. Bless us, give success to the work of our hands, and continue to unite and bless all of us. And we pray now in the words Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. How can I thank you enough for the encouragement that you give me? Thanks for being with me for this hour, and we'll be back live tomorrow night, remember, with a special program for clergy at 9 o'clock. 8 o'clock, I'll be live with my uh, Praying for America tomorrow night. 9 o'clock, the Good Shepherd Project. We're going to talk to clergy. We're going to talk about clergy. We're going to talk to you about how you can encourage clergy. Tomorrow night, spread the word to your pastor if you can send him a message. And this is for any denomination. Send him a message that this is going to be on tomorrow night. And uh, let's see if we can give him some help in speaking up about this terrible evil of abortion. Thank you all. Have a great night. And uh, we'll talk to you tomorrow. God bless. <laughs>